Welcome everyone to this uh, new seminar of the Integrative Research Seminar Series, okay, whose purpose is to uh, make known the research of uh, professors of the Department of Information and Communication Technologies, okay, within the university. And uh, my pleasure today is to introduce uh, Tony Borra, okay. He heads one of the groups here in biomedical electronics uh, research. He got his PhD uh, 10 years ago at the Polytechnic University, and since then he has been traveling quite a lot. He is uh, he's currently a Sarah Hunter professor, but before that he was a Marie Curie Fellow, uh, Ramonica Health Fellow, and so on. Here, the, uh, in the last five years, I think, at the University of Pompeu Fabra, and before that, he was in France, he was also in Berkeley, California, and uh, traveled a lot. Okay, today the title, okay, it's there. So I was telling Tony that uh, when I was reading the title, Healing Signals, okay, Delivery of Electrical Currents, it was like a contrast, okay, between the two things, but uh, he'll explain, okay, how the two things go together. So without further ado, so Tony, thank you. Okay, thanks Hector for the introduction, and thank you all for being here. To listen about the research we are performing at the Biomedical Electronics Research Group, which basically it's about applying currents to living organisms, to tissues, for biomedical applications. More specifically, we are interested in uh, medical applications. We are interested in the phenomena related to the delivery of those currents, what happens with those currents when they go into living tissues, let's say, but more than in the phenomenon we are interested in, in the applications. So that's basically what I'm going to talk about that. And before talking about the projects, we are working on the projects that we have been working recently. I need to introduce a little bit what are the effects of applying currents to living tissues. And for that, what I'm going to use is a model for the cell. Okay, a very simple model for the cell in which we consider that the cell, the living cell, the biological cell, is just an electrolyte solution, so an ionic solution surrounded or sealed by a thin fat layer, the plasma membrane, the cell membrane, and which is separates it from the external medium, which is just an electrolyte solution, also an ionic solution, okay? In turn, I'm also doing an approximation, which is what engineers do, of the tissues just as a regular, very symmetrical uh, aggregation of cells. Of course, those are very rough approximations, tissues, Actual tissues are much more complex than that. These are actual slides, histological slides from soft tissues, different tissues, and the cell itself, the biological cell, is much more complex than that. But this model is quite good for describing what happens in terms of electrical properties of a tissue or of a cell. So we have this model, we start with that, and the first thing that we will observe is that if we apply very low currents, very low magnitude currents, we are basically not going to do anything to the biological cell. But by delivering this current, we are going to be able to measure the voltage that drops. So we are going to be able to measure the impedance of a tissue or of a cell in suspension. And if we take these impedance measurements and try to match what we see to an electric circuit, what we are going to see is that the properties of what, so the data that we record matches quite well this circuit, okay? And this circuit makes sense according to this model. Basically, what we have is a resistor that models what happens in terms of the extracellular space. So the extracellular space has said that it's an ionic solution, or we approximate it as an ionic solution. So basically, we have a conductive <coughs> material there. So it's going to behave as an element, as a resistance that obeys the Ohm's law. The same thing happens with the interior of the cell. The interior of the cell is also going to be an ionic solution. So basically it's going to behave as another resistance. And in between these two conductive media, we have a fat layer. We are talking about something very thin. We are talking about something in the order of five nanometers. So if you remember your basic courses on physics, we have two conductive media, two metallic plates, and we have an insulator in between those two conductive media, what we have is a capacitor, a capacitance. So this is what we are going to observe if we apply very low currents, okay? And this is what we typically refer in the field as electrical bioimpedance or just simply bioimpedance. 
And this is something that we can measure. So we can measure, we can use electrodes to measure the bioimpedance of a tissue or a, of a sink of a whole body. And from that, we can obtain some interesting data. We can characterize tissues, so we can differentiate some specific tissues, and we can also monitor tissues, how monitor, for example, evolves with a certain pathology. And this is basically what I did in the past. This is what I did during my PhD. In particular, what I was doing when I was doing my PhD was to monitor impedance of tissues in the context of organ transplantation. The idea was that when the organs are harvested, the organs start to suffer because they don't, are not supplied with blood, and we wanted to monitor that suffering. We wanted to monitor how they are damaged. Okay? So we used impedance for that. What happens is that when there is this suffering of the tissue, basically the cells start to increase, and this compresses the extracellular space, and the impedance at low magnitudes increases. Uh, I also participated in a, in a, in a product development of which was intended to do, or actually realized, implemented, a system for monitoring caries, or for detecting caries, based on impedance, okay? This is a case of tissue characterization. So that belongs to the past, as I said. Now we are more interested in applying currents that have an effect, okay? More than just looking at what happens in terms of passive properties. So again, we use the same model, the same circuit, and if we have two resistors here, we have two resistors that obey the Ohm's law, what we have to expect is that power, electrical power, is going to be lost here in the form of energy, in the form, sorry, of heat. So this happens when we apply moderate currents for quite a long time. What we are going to have is significant heating, so warming the, the tissues up. So this is what is known as dual heating. And this is, explains one of the adverse consequences of applying currents to living organisms. If you apply currents, excessive currents to living organisms, you are going to provoke burns, okay? This is one of the less disgusting pictures I was able to, to get. So uh, if we can kill tissues, we can use it, okay? So we basically can use it for destroying tumors, okay? And this is now a quite common technique in, 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 surgery, in surgery, okay? In the case of the liver, for example, it's quite complicated to excise the, a tumor, which is basically the first approach it's going to be done. If you can excise it, do it, excise the tumor. But in some cases, it's not possible to excise the tumor. And the liver, in particular, is one of those areas where you typically don't, you cannot cut the tumor because it has a lot of vasculature, so you are going to provoke a lot of problems. So it's better to try to kill the tumor, to destroy the tumor. And in this case, heat is used by applying radio frequency currents. So we apply, or typically clinicians apply currents of frequencies about 40, uh, sorry, 400 kilohertz, and they burn the, the tissue, okay? And this is something that can be performed just by inserting things from the exterior, okay? You don't have to expose the liver. We go again to the model, and we discuss what happens with these two resistors. You see here that we have this capacitor. So if we apply a pulse, or a DC voltage, what is going to happen, and probably you also remember that from physics, what is going to happen is that voltage is going to start to build up across these two plates, okay? The voltage is going to increase. And if the voltage is excessive, what may happen once you have a dielectric is what is called dielectric rupture, okay? So the capacitor that we have here is not going to behave anymore as a dielectric, it's not going to behave as an insulator, but it's going to start to conduct electricity, okay? This is what happens, for example, you have two plates and you apply a very large voltage, we're talking about kilovolts, at some point, the air is going to start to conduct. This is what a spark is, okay? This dielectric rupture. In the case of living organisms, in the case of living cells, we have something similar. The physics is different, but we have this phenomenon of dielectric rupture. And this is what we call electroporation, okay? Electroporation, it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon because it not only implies that we are going to have current going through these two plates, okay, through this capacitor, so through the membrane, but it also implies that molecules, which are quite large, can get into the cell and can get out of the cell, okay? So the membrane, which is normally sealing the interior of the cell, suddenly becomes quite permeable to molecules. And more interesting than that is the fact that if this state of poration, this state of increased permeability is not very severe, the cell is going to be able to recover after that transient permeabilization. So we have a mechanism to get things into the cell and have the cell 
be viable afterwards. Okay? This is typically used a lot in microbiology labs. In microbiology labs, they use this electroporation phenomenon in order to introduce DNA okay, for transformation of the cells. I will talk a little bit more about that later. So I said that the phenomenon is not similar to the physics, it's different from the dielectric rupture we have in the air or in other uh, kind of dielectrics. The physics is still not completely understood, so let's say there is not an agreement of what happens, but what it is believed to happen is that pores, actual holes, are being created in the membrane. Okay? And what you see here are recent molecular dynamic simulations by other people, which what you see here, the blue thing, it's the tails of the phospholipid layer, okay? so the membrane, so this is like five nanometers, and the red dots here and the white dots are the water. And what is observed by simulation is that when you apply an electric field, which is quite large, this, there are fingers that at some point join and you create a channel. Okay? So that's where pores start, where holes start, that's where the name comes from, this electroporation. So the model that I just used now, it's, it's quite simple. I said that it agrees with what we observe when we are applying low magnitudes. But in reality, the cells are a little bit more complicated than that. And in particular, what happens is that the interior of the cell it's negative with respect to the exterior, okay? And this is something that is maintained in an active way, okay? So cells is, are not only passive in electric terms, but are also active. And we also have some special structures in the membrane, structures that are ionic channels, which open and close according to the voltage that we have between the interior of the exterior of the cell at that point, okay? So we have a combination of not only of passive properties, but we also have active properties and we have nonlinear properties. And so this tries to model, but this at the end what explains what is a nerve impulse. Okay? The fact that we have cells that have this model for the membrane explains what happens with what we call excitable cells. Excitable cells are neurons, okay, which are in the brain or in the nerves, and myocardial cells, for example. And these cells, what they do, or what they are able to do, is to make a perturbation in voltage travel through their membrane. Okay? So if, for some reason, the voltage in a segment of the membrane is perturbated at, beyond the threshold, this perturbation is going to travel through the membrane. Okay? In the case of axons, the axons are very long neurons. Actually, they can be one meter or more. This perturbation is going to travel. And this is what we call a nerve impulse. In general, so it's a nerve impulse in the domain of, of neurons. In general, these waves, these voltage waves, are what we call action potentials. And the interesting thing is that they typically are generated because there are some chemical transmitters, what are called neurotransmitters, which have an impact on those switches that we have, the protein channels that we have in the membrane, that open or close them so that they, they cause the initial perturbation in voltage. But we can also initiate an action potential by delivering a current. So we have a mechanism for artificially generating action potentials, for artificially generating something equivalent to nerve impulses. So that allows us to do, let's say, neural engineering. We can play with the nervous system. Of course, this is something we can do for good, but this is something that can also come from bad. Okay? This is one of also the mechanisms why people is electrocuted. If you mess with the heart rhythm because you apply currents, you are going to, to kill the person. So um, all these things that I presented involve applying currents to living organisms. And currents are applying to living organisms basically always through electrodes. Okay? So if we have two electrodes, typically metallic electrodes, in addition to all the things that I described, we are also going to have electrochemistry. So we are going to have electrochemical reactions, redox, reactions, so reduction and oxidation re reactions at the electrodes, so at the interface between the electrode and the tissue, or the electrode, let's say, and the extracellular medium, and also reactions in the, in the middle. In the middle, basically, what is going to happen is that we are going to drag or pull the ions, the particles that have some charge. So this is the re reactions and electrophoresis. This is what we can label in general as electrochemistry. So those are basically the phenomena I discussed related to the delivery of currents to living organisms. And I'm going to present the, the project that we have been working recently in that framework. Okay? The order is not the same because basically I want to talk more about what we have been doing recently on electroporation 
and on electrical stimulation. And this is going to be the large part of, of the talk, okay? But just, I'm going to introduce briefly two projects that we have been doing in these two domains, let's say. So what we have done regarding uh, electrochemistry. What we are doing regarding this domain is something very oriented to a very specific application. Actually, we can say that it's a product development which tries to solve a problem, a problem caused by clinicians, a problem caused when biopsies are taken. So in particular, we are talking about prostate biopsies. This is something that, unfortunately, some of us will, go, will have to go through. So the idea is that when uh, there's some suspicious that there may be prostate cancer, so biopsies need to be taken in order to do histology and confirm the, the kind of cancer that we have. Okay, so basically what the clinician, the urologist does is go with an biopsy, well, with, sorry, with an ultrasound probe to visualize the prostate, okay? And once the prostate is identified, the clinician goes with a biopsy gun, with a needle, uh, through the rectum and takes a sample from the prostate. The problem here is that bacteria, which normally is confined within the rectum, which is safe there, meaning it's not causing any problem because the rectum is wall of the rectum is a natural barrier to, to bacteria. Once we go with the biopsy needle, this is something that is done a number of times, we cause a puncture of the rectum and this bacteria is going to go into tissue, it's going to go into the prostate, and those are going to cause infections. Okay? This is something that it's, the risk of that is minimized, the risk of infections minimized with bacteria, with antibiotics. But even using antibiotics, there is a significant rate of people being infected. Okay? And this is a problem because we are talking about serious infections of people that has to be re-hospitalized. So this is our cost, economic cost, and this is also a safety issue. I mean, this, the, these infections can be quite serious and life-threatening. So what we are proposing is um, a mechanism to, to avoid that, which basically consists on covering the biopsy needle with silver, with a very lay, thin layer of silver, and then once the needle is inside the tissues, releasing this silver by applying a current. So this current is going to release the silver into the tissues, and this silver, silver ions, are going to combine with the chloride that naturally is within the tissues, and that's going to form silver chloride. And this silver chloride, after the needle is removed, is going to slowly release silver ions, which are going to have an antibacterial effect. This is something that now we are doing quite extensive in vitro research, and now we are moving into, into in vivo and to develop prototypes moving towards the clinical essay. Okay? This is something that we really want to push as, as a product. Okay, now we switch to what we have been doing regarding your heating. And this comes from basically this picture, which it's about some reports that were in mass media actually and in also in scientific reports a few years ago about a new technique, new modality for treating glioblastomas, which is a kind of brain cancer, which is, has a very bad prognosis. And the, the things, this company, which is of course related to our research group, what they were claiming is that they were able to uh, stop or slow the progression of glioblastomas by applying very low currents. Okay, we are talking about currents that are supposed not to cause dual heating, as not supposed to cause electrochemical reactions no electroporation, no electrical stimulation. So that's quite intriguing to anybody in the field. And of course, I, I was intrigued, like everybody in the field, let's say, of bioelectrics. And what uh, I did, just a simple calculation to see if it was true what they said, that there's no dual heating, okay, or significant dual heating, because once you apply currents, you for sure are doing some, some dual heating. And the dual heating that they were causing, it was really mild but it was, not some, it was not zero. I mean, they, the calculations show that we should expect an increase in temperature of about a few, a few uh, fractions of a degree, okay? Or even a degree or two degrees. So the, my, my concern or my, what I thought here is okay, they are doing some dual heating and this is a modality, a modality which is unusual because the treatments normally are last for a short period of time. Okay, we typically apply treatments for minutes, hours, okay, no more than that. And here we are dealing with a treatment in which the company and the researchers were proposing, were proposing to be applied for weeks, months, so continuously. So the idea was that the patient would be carrying always, 
or it's carrying, I mean, actually it's a treatment that is in use. It's carrying always a backpack with a battery and with a radio frequency generator for generating these fields, which they call two more treatment fields. And then the, the so the, 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 that's the way they propose. And this is unusual, I said, because normally treatments are applied for a short, very short period of time. And I speculated that maybe the fact that they were causing a mild heating over a long time was explaining the results they had, okay? Because this was never tried. I mean, the fact of applying very mild heating for a long time as a cancer treatment modality was never used. Hypothermia, so to increase the temperature with radio frequency fields or with, by other means, it's used. It's used in oncology. It's used in oncology, but for moderate increases in temperature, we're talking about five degrees increases and for short times, okay? This is something that is used in combination with chemotherapy. It's known to, to, to be useful. So there were some indications that this mild heating applied for a long time could be, could be the reason why it was working, slightly working, and, and it could be helpful to, to realize that. So basically, it was basically pure speculation. And that's why we asked together with Gabriel Capella from the Institut Catalan d'Oncologia for one of those explorer grants, because that was pure speculation. And what we wanted to see is that if moderate temperature, very mild temperature increase, can help in terms of treating a tumor, okay? And at the same time, to see if tumor treatment fields do something. So basically what we did it was to implant subcutaneous, subcutaneously implant tumors in the back of mice, and then to treat them, to treat them either with pure hyperthermia, okay, very moderate, or with uh, two more treatment fields, okay, with these low magnitude fields. Tumors were pancreatic tumors from human origin. And then what we combined also these treatments with uh, chemotherapy, okay, the standard chemotherapy applied for that kind of tumor. And what we saw is that, well, the hypothesis I have was not true, at least in this model. I mean, the temperature alone Increase in temperature alone didn't do anything without the drug or with the drug. So there was no benefit in statistical terms. The tumors basically were growing at the same rate. Okay? This is a treatment was applied for one week. On the other hand, by applying these tumor treatment fields, although we didn't see anything when we were not applying the chemotherapy, the chemotherapy drug, sorry, we had a significant statistically significant reduction in the tumor growth, the rate of growth, when we were applying the tumor treatment fields. So by combining the tumor treatment fields and the gencitabine, which is the drug that is used, we, the tumors were growing slowly, okay? It was not that we were killing the tumors. It was not that we were stopping them from growing. It was just that we were slowing them, okay? So for us, this is really intriguing because we don't know what is happening. The of course, the, the, the company that is behind this product and the research team that is behind this, this product, they, they have their own explanations because of the, otherwise they could not get the FDA. So they need explanations to justify why they are applying that. But we have looked into that, into those explanations, and the numbers simply don't make any sense. So we still don't know what, what's going on. The thing is that we would like to go into that, but at the same time, we are just slowing the tumors. We are not destroying. And we will see now that with electroporation, this is something that we can do. We can destroy the tumors. So we basically are more interested in continuing our work with electroporation. That was just an exploration. So what we do in regarding electroporation and electrical stimulation, which I think are the fields that are have more potential for collaboration within the department. So electroporation. Again, electroporation, it's a phenomenon which describes an increase in the permeability of the membrane to ions or even to large molecules when elective fields, large magnitude, are applied to the cell, to the living organism, to the tissue, okay? So um, that those fields are typically applied as short pulses, very short pulses, okay, 100 microseconds, for example, in order to prevent joule heating, okay? So we are sure that we are not doing joule heating or significant joule heating. And depending on the magnitude of these pulses, okay, and the way they are applied, I mean, the duration of the pulses, the number of pulses, the frequency of those pulses, but basically on the magnitude, we can have either reversible or irreversible electroporation. So reversible electroporation means that after a transient period in which the membrane is more permeable, the membrane is going to reseal, 
and the cell is going to be perfectly viable afterwards. Okay? The cell is going to survive. This allows us to introduce things into the cell, as I said. Okay? This allows us to introduce DNA. And this, as I said, is used a lot in microbiology labs. This is also started to be used in vivo for gene therapy. Okay? And it's also used in what it's called electrochemotherapy, which is the introduction of a chemotherapy therapeutic agent, therapeutic drug, into the cell for destroying the cells that have been exposed to the electric field. Okay, so this is, has huge applications, but we are actually more interested into irreversible electroporation. This is because of historical reasons, because when I was at Berkeley, basically at that lab, they were starting to work on irreversible electroporation, so mean applying high fields so that the cells will not survive, as an ablation modality, so as a method to destroy tissues, and a method to destroy tumors. And why this is interesting? This is interesting because although there are some other ablation techniques, like radiofrequency ablation, laser ablation, cryosurgery, and micro, yeah, say microwave ablation, so although there are those other techniques, all those other techniques are based on temperature changes, okay? Are based on changing the temperature of the tissues, so basically they kill because they destroy the proteins. And they not only destroy the proteins, let's say, of the cell itself, but they also destroy the proteins that are surrounding the cell. So this model that I was using, assuming that the cell is just surrounded by an ionic solution, is not valid anymore. Actually, tissues have uh, what is called a scaffold, which surrounds the cell, which is made of proteins, basically, and other molecules, which create the mechanical uh, structure of a tissue. And it's very relevant. It's very important. Okay. So electroporation is not destroying that. Electroporation is just destroying the cells, which in a lot of cases is what we want to destroy. We want to destroy the tumor cells. We don't want to destroy the tissue itself. So that's why there is a huge interest in that, because that can mean that we can treat things that with other methods cannot be treated, and we can prevent damage that is caused by the other techniques. So that's what we are working on. What, basically, what we are doing is engineering on that. And what kind of engineering we do? One of the things that we do, it's how to improve the treatment planning of electroporation. So electroporation for a specific protocol, meaning a specific set, a number of pulses, a specific duration of those pulses, and a frequency, occurs in a point in the tissue where the electric field goes beyond the threshold. So if we compute the electric field, we can estimate in a tissue, with a configuration, of the electrodes in the configuration of the tissue, we can estimate which areas of the tissue are going to be killed and which areas are not going to be killed. So we can do what it's called treatment planning. This is an evolving field because we have to take into account the conductivities of the tissues. We have to, account, to take into account that the conductivities of tissues change because of electroporation. And we are doing contributions in that sense. We are doing contributions in the sense of how we can improve treatment planning. Okay, Not so much the tools for treatment planning, but the models for treatment planning. Another thing that we do is to collaborate with biomedical teams in order to explore new applications for electroporation, for irreversible electroporation. This, for instance, is a study that we conducted a few years ago with the group of Christina Fillet at the time at the CRG, the PRBB, now in, at EDVAPS, and in which Christina was interested in treating pancreatic cancers with um, uh, uh, viral vectors. So I approached her regarding the use of irreversible electroporation, and we started to see if we could do something for, for that. And what we did it was to a safety study on the use of irreversible electroporation. And what we did it was to implant now pancreatic tumors within the pancreas of mice. Okay? We were able to see how those tumors were growing, because this, the cells of the tumor also, th there are special uh, genetically modified cells also emit light, so we can basically, with a very sensitive camera, detect how the tumor is growing. So when the tumor was large enough, then we open, let's say, the, the mouse, we expose the pancreas, and we applied the electroporation where the tumor was located, or where we thought the tumor was located. And then in some cases, in a large, actually a large number of cases, the tumor was gone after, after a few weeks. So that improved the overall survival of the, of the animals very significantly. But as I said, what we were interested, because we knew that we would get this result, what we were basically interested in is in a safety study. We studied that by treating the pancreas, we were not creating any, any other problems. And this is uh, something that it's, it's already done. I mean, this is already something that in clinics, 
it's already in some very specific places. Electroporation is used as a, as a way to, to treat pancreatic cancers where no, there are no other alternatives. It's not, never the first approach, okay, until now. So in the same line of collaboration with biomedical teams, this is also a project which is ongoing. This is a very ambitious project which is ongoing, which starts with this slide. This corresponds to a case in which tumors in the liver are spread a lot. So we have a, number, a large number of tumors spread all over the tumor, all over the liver, sorry. And this is a case which, in which if the, to, these tumors don't respond to chemotherapy, there are few options for treating them. Because basically, we cannot excise them by surgery. We cannot treat them locally. It's one by one, just by thermal methods or even by electroporation. So the Fernando Bordillo, a surgeon at the Hospital del Mar, proposed to us, okay, could you consider to treat the whole liver instead of going tumor by tumor, and then assume that we are going to destroy the tumors and not destroy the healthy liver? Okay, we do that. Uh, there's, a, there's a slight change or a slight difference in the conductivity of the tumors and of the, of the liver. If we do that, what we find according to simulations is that we are actually going to kill not only the tumors, but we are also going to kill the tissues. Actually, we're even going to kill more the healthy tissue than the, than the tumors. So that was no option. But at the same time, uh, Dr. Bourdieu noticed to us that the liver is, is a particular organ in terms of blood supply. In the liver, we not only have blood coming from the artery, okay, the, in this case the hepatic artery, but we also have blood coming from the portal vein. Okay, from the guts. And the thing is that these ratios of irrigation, let's say, are true for the healthy liver. But in the case of the tumors, there is only, in the case of the tumors, there is only blood coming from the hepatic artery. So what we propose is to apply a liquid with high conductivity, saline solution, this is salt, okay, through the portal vein so that we increase the conductivity of the healthy liver tissue without increasing the conductivity of the tumor tissue. And by having this contrast in conductivity, when we apply a field, by applying a voltage across these two plates, the field is going to concentrate on the tumors. So we are going to destroy the tumors without destroying the uh, healthy liver. This sounds like a quite reasonable, simple idea. In practical terms, this is a madness, okay? This is one of the projects I will say that if it was proposed by an engineer, the medical teams would say, you are mad, you don't know what, uh, so what surgery is. But since it was proposed by a surgeon, everything is fine, okay? So we can go ahead. And it's, it's very ambitious. I mean, this, we are talking about people that has very bad prognosis. I mean, there's nothing we can do with these people. So the outcome would be very relevant. And it's very ambitious in terms of all the things that we have to do in order to be able to implement that, okay? And because of that, we like that because it's, it's forcing us to do new things and discover new things. One of the things that we discover is that when we started to uh, apply large areas of the liver in which there was a tumor by two plates, okay, by in the mice, so in this case it was easy because it was very small. So what, one of the things that we discovered is that those animals few minutes after applying the protocol, applying the pulses, died, okay? And at the beginning we were shocked because we expected that maybe some of the animals would die during the delivery of the pulses because of the arrhythmias caused by the pulses. Never happened. We were not expecting, we were not expecting such a sudden death minutes after, after the, the, the electroporation. What we discovered is that by doing electroporation, by destroying that large amount of tissue, we are releasing a large amount of intracellular contents into the bloodstream. In particular, we are releasing a lot of potassium, okay? And potassium is known to be lethal if the concentration of potassium is too high in the bloodstream. So basically, we tried a therapy, let's say, in order to prevent the effect of potassium, and actually also to reduce the effect of potassium, and yes, it worked. We were able to minimize the number of animals dying, actually, we were producing them a lot. So this fact, this phenomenon, the fact that we are causing a lot of potassium, and this is 
can be lethal. This is something that was never described before, and it's relevant because clinicians that now are using irreversible electroporation are treating larger and larger tumors. So our study serves as a warning note to those clinicians. Okay, so it's just to be aware that you have to monitor electrolytes because we here are causing a massive release of ionic contents from interior of the cells. Another thing that this project is forcing us to do is to increase, let's say, the power of generators. Okay? The generators we have been using, this is the prototype we developed here and has been used for, for a long time, and is still used. It's in terms of the voltage that it's applied and in terms of the current that we are able to apply, it's very similar to the commercial generators that are now used in, 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 in hospitals, okay, for doing irreversible electroporation. So, but that was not enough for doing this concept of transhepatic electroporation. We needed something more powerful. So basically we partnered with a team experts on power electronics at the University of Zaragoza, and we have built something with much more advanced capabilities in terms of voltage and in terms of current. And this what was intended for our own problem, and now it's becoming something that it's useful for other people. Actually, the companies that are producing the commercial systems for irreversible electroporation are now in contact with us because of this device. Okay, this is a device that quite likely we are going to license to them, okay? Because they are interested in being able to treat larger and larger volumes, okay? So yes, the voltages, we are talking about two kilovolts. The currents that we apply are large, look dangerous, and are dangerous, so we have to be careful. So last topic, I'm going to talk about what we do in this domain, in the domain of electrical stimulation. I'm starting just with a video which is from a group which has nothing to do with us, okay? This is our research, which was in mass media a few years ago, so maybe you, you saw that in TV or another place. And what these guys did, it was to implant electrodes on the brain of a patient, which was completely paralyzed, so with tetraplegia, so she can only move the, the muscles of the head. And basically, by thinking about movement, and by implementing very sophisticated learning algorithms, these guys were able to send comments to a robotic arm to move whatever they, she wanted to move. In this case, she's holding and taking a, a, a bottle of water. Okay? This is quite impressive. I mean, the, the, the amount of decoding, okay, this is, was basically on, the, on, the, on the, the electrodes were in the areas related to movement, and they had to decode those movement intentions. This is quite, quite amazing. But you can see that, although she will look really happy, the, the, the practical prospects of that are very limited. I mean, we are talking about a robotic arm, we are talking about implants on the brain which are invasive, and, 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 and in addition to that, you have to take into account that those electrodes are not going to last for a long time. So, yes, it's, it's very nice, but it's not practical. It's not going to be practical in the next years, for sure. So this cartoon illustrates what we saw, okay, this paradigm of having signals from the brain being decoded and being sent to a robotic arm. And the question here is, why not to interface directly with human muscles? I mean, in the case of patients with paralysis, in most of the cases, the muscles are perfectly okay. okay? So we, in principle, can stimulate those muscles, actually the nerves that go through to those muscles, we can stimulate those nerves for performing movement, I mean, to create movement. So why not to use the muscles, which is going to be better for a, long, for, for a lot of reasons, cosmetic reasons, for health reasons, for a large number of reasons. So the short answer is that we don't have the technological means to do that, okay? We can do electrical stimulation of things that are, let's say, very close, but when we have to perform electrical stimulation of points that are spread over a large portion of the body, then we have a problem, okay? We have a problem related with the invasiveness of the, of the method, of the electronics we have to put there. So I'm just stating again the problem here. And what typically is done now in order to electrical stimulation, the systems that we, now we have for electrical stimulation, pacemakers, deep brain stimulation, spinal cord stimulation, the systems that are based on delivering currents to excitable tissues, basically consist of a relatively large unit, which is implanted subcutaneously, and then this system is wired to the electrodes that 
perform this immersion, that deliver the currents to the tissue. So that works nicely, as I said, for things that are not very spread to the body. Okay? If we have to act on this muscle here, and this muscle here, and this muscle here, we will need a large number of wires. And this is going to make the surgery very complex okay, and very invasive. So, so in this case, for solving that in the 90s, it was proposed a new paradigm, which was to develop single channel wireless microstimulators, which could be deployed at different sites okay, by just minimally invasive procedures, very similar to injection rather than surgery. And those microstimulators, okay, which had just a single channel, so they already contained the two electrodes needed for performing for delivering the current. These would be active. Those, I'm sorry, would form a quite dense network, which will be controlled by an external unit. Okay, and the external unit would be able to send the signals to each one of those stimulators to activate them or to deactivate them. So, in order to be able to create quite complex movement patterns, so. The idea was nice, was neat actually, but the problem is that the implementation was not really successful. And it was not really successful because the implants that were developed according to this paradigm were too large. Were too large and more than large, I mean, they had quite significant diameter, they may look large, short, or small for you, but they are large for implantation. More than that, they were rigid, mechanically rigid, so they were quite invasive. So at the end, only like five or four of those implants were in deployed in a patient. Okay, so this concept of a dense network of, of implants was never developed. So what we are proposing is to improve this idea. What we are proposing is to develop microstimulators, which are going basically to look like what you see here, a flexible, a short piece of flexible thread, okay, in which there, there are going to be two electrodes at opposite ends, and then a small electronic piece in the middle or whatever you want here in the axon. Because of that feature, because of the way they look, and because of their functionality, we coined for them the name electronic axons, e-axons. And the thing here is, well, how this is possible? Well, the, pos the, the, the limitation of those two devices is that they were either powered by batteries or they were powered by inductive coupling. In both cases, it implies large, bulky pieces which have to be integrated within the implant. And that was the problem. That was why these technologies were not reduced okay, in terms of size. Here what we are proposing is complete, something completely different. What we propose is that the implants, rather than using coils or batteries, what they are going to do is to rectify currents. Okay? What we are going to do is to apply high frequencies through the tissues where the implants are located, okay? and then the implants are going to rectify those currents. What's going on here? So we apply the high frequency currents like that. Okay? So we are talking about frequencies beyond one megahertz, so not so high frequency, and then apply it in short episodes, in bursts. Because they are high frequency, they don't cause a stimulation. Okay? Remember the capacitor. Okay? The membrane acts basically as a low pass filter. So excitable cells don't feel high frequencies, okay? in other words. And because they are applied in short episodes, they don't hit the tissue. So basically, those currents are innocuous. They don't do anything to tissue. On the other hand, the implants, what they are going to do is to rectify. So we are going to get these gray peaks here. Okay? And this is equivalent, if we look at the low frequency contents, to a pulse signal. And those pulses are able to stimulate. So now we are saying that we are generating pulses about 10 hertz or 100 hertz, depending on the frequency of those bursts. So basically we have a means for generating low frequency currents from high frequency currents. And the nice thing here, why we can make these things very thin, very flexible, is that the, in the other cases they were using coils, they were using batteries. In this case, we are only using electronics. Okay, fructification is a matter of electronics. So this can be reduced a lot. This can be integrated in a single integrated circuit. So very, something very tiny. And we are working in that direction. So this is something that we would like to develop. Of course, this needs huge resources, okay, which we are struggling to get them. But in the meantime, we are 
providing new evidences that this idea, this concept, it's doable, it's feasible. So the first, so sorry, this is the way the external system will look like, okay? We still would have implants within the body and externally we would apply by means of an external control which would also contain a battery. This system, this external system would contain a battery and would generate the high frequency current and the commands to the implants. And those commands and that high frequency current would be delivered through uh, textile electrodes. So textile electrodes because basically we are dealing with high frequency signals. Okay, so from the exterior also cosmetically appealing. So I said that we are working towards uh, providing evidence that the method makes sense. One of the first things that we did it was to implant a diode, okay, which is the simplest rectifier you can think about in, a, in an earthworm. Okay? And we showed that, yes, the system is able to perform a stimulation where the diode is located and is not doing anything else where the diode is not located. But the diode it serves as a proof of concept but the diode, uh, it's not practical for clinical applications. It's not practical because not only we are going to generate those low frequency pulses at 10 hertz, but we are also going to generate a DC component, okay, a continuous component, a component at zero hertz. So this zero hertz signal, this continuous signal, it's going to cause electrochemical reactions. Okay, it's going to cause electrochemical reactions at the electrodes, which are going to damage both the electrodes and the tissues. Okay? So what we did recently it was to improve this idea of the diode. Basically what we did is was to the diode, we added a capacitor, here I split it in two capacitors just for geometrical convenience, and a resistor, so that we blocked the DC component. So now the system is not generating DC components, but it's still generating low frequency currents able to cause the stimulation. Okay, and this is the prototype, you see that it looks much less invasive than previous system. And we tried it. I mean, we ex did in vivo experiments with it. Basically what we did, it was to implant it uh, in, in rabbits. Basically, we went with a catheter. So if the catheter contains a stainless needle, okay, to introduce the catheter. And we used that needle in order to locate the point where we wanted to perform a stimulation for the movement we wanted to achieve. Okay, so we here are applying an external generator to locate that point. So once we located that point, we removed the needle and we introduced the stimulator. And this is how the stimulator, the micro stimulator, looks once inserted. Okay, this is an X-ray image. <coughs> Again, I'm going to continue describing the experiment. So what we did it was either to implant those devices in the gastrocnemius muscle, so basically this muscle here, or in the tibialis muscle, which is the muscle we have here in front. Okay, and with that, the idea was to obtain two different kinds of movements, either plantar flexion, which is called plantar flexion, or dose deflection, okay? So depending where the implant was located, we would get one movement or the other movement. Then we applied over high frequency signals, okay? Or high frequency signals in order to be rectified them by the implants. This is the setup, how it looks like. We used a force measurement system and these are some force recordings, okay? This is force recordings for the case in which we have the implant here at the tibialis. This is just to show that the force recording that we get by doing this rectification are equivalent to the force recordings we would have if we were doing direct stimulation of the muscle with conventional pulses, okay? This is what, that's basically the same. What you see here is the 20 episodes of high frequency, when they are applied at quite low frequency, we induce individual twitches of the muscle. So it's what called an individual twitch, okay? Once we reduce the frequency, those twitches are fused and they create a larger contraction. Nothing else. Now you are going to see a video of that working, okay? So in this case, you barely are going to see any movement because the, you are only going to see the contraction of the muscle because the leg is anchored, okay? So you are going to see here the contraction happening, okay? So those were 10 bars applied at, at 10 hertz. So says one day later, this study was performed for four weeks. Okay, the animals were not anesthetized during the four weeks, only during these experiments. Okay, as here you see that by increasing the frequency, you only see a single contraction and it looks more stronger, stronger, okay? 
and now just for illustration, you are going to see an experiment in which the leg was free to move. Okay? It's in the other muscle. Before it was in the gastrocnemius muscle, the posterior, now it's in the frontal muscle. So you see a single contraction applying quite large frequency, and now you are going to see 10 individual contractions. Okay, so that's nice. Okay, we have a system that it's able to perform stimulation inside tissues in a very specific place where we put the implant, okay, and which can be deployed in a minimally invasive way. And this is something that we expect is going to be used for different applications of electrical stimulation which are not related with paralysis. For example, this in principle could be used for pain. I mean, there's some kind of pain related to the nerves, I mean, which is related to some malfunctioning of the nerve, and which can be prevented or avoided by performing electrical stimulation. But you have to be very selective, you have to be very close to the nerve. So in that sense, we think the system can work, but we are, let's say, more ambitious than that. We want to be able to be able to stimulate at different points at the time we want to perform a stimulation. So we want to create complex movements. We are aiming this paralysis approach. So for that, we need something more intelligent. So we need something in which with the same two external electrodes, we can command each one of the implants. We can activate implant one, we can deactivate implant one, then activate number two, immediately activate number three, etc. So to perform kind of movement patterns. And we are, as I said, working towards that. Since we cannot afford the development of an integrated circuit, what we have done, it's a prototype made with off-the-shelf components. So meaning components that you can buy in an electronic shop. Okay, we are talking about very tiny components. And this is a prototype we recently implemented. You see here, it's semi-flexible, okay, it's semi-rigid. Basically, it's mounted on a semi-rigid printed circuit board, and it's encapsulated with silicone. So this is a proof of concept uh, prototype. This is not going to be usable for long times, okay? And what this circuit contains here, okay, which is quite complex, is, is what you see here. What we have here, it's a digital unit, in this case a microcontroller, uh, probably the smallest available in the market, which by means of a demodulator receives comments. So here notice that we only have two electrodes. So in the high frequency signal that we are sending through the tissues, we encode uh, the comments, we encode the addresses of the implant we want to activate. So it demodulates this thing and the, according to what this it's received, it decides whether or not to activate the current sources that it has. Okay, it decides whether or not allow current to go that way or that way. Okay, so we developed that, and we also tried that thing recently. In this case, we did a study which was very similar to the study that you just saw. But in this case, instead of implanting the implanting the implant in one muscle or in the other muscle, what we did it was to implant at the same time two implants, okay? one in the tibialis and another one in the gastrocnemius. And these two movements, either the dorsiflexion or the plantar flexion, are going to be achieved by addressing either this one or by addressing this one. And this is what you are going to see now in a video. The video is it's quite short, it's not the best video that we could produce because you are only going to see a twitch of the, of the leg. Okay? So what we are going to do is to send a command. We have a virtual instrument with a click. We select this implant or we select this implant. And this is what you are going to see here. So just pay attention to the leg. So here you see one of the movements, a single twitch, so that's why it's so fast, and then the other one. So now you are going to see it at slow speed. So it's a little bit clearer. So this is, these are very recent results, not, not yet published. So, and that's basically what I wanted to tell you about, and I need for first, before concluding, to thank all the members of my, of my team, all the PhD students. In particular, I'd like to thank King TV and Laura for the tremendous work that they have been doing in all these projects that you have seen, huge work. And of course, all the past members of the, of the group, which include even undergrad students. 
and all our collaborators, external collaborators, and the agencies that funded our research. And thanks to you for being here. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Thank you, Victor. Yes, yes. Well, yeah. What they did, uh, they claimed that there was no temperature increase, and what they did is was to measure the temperature just beneath the external electrodes that they are using. Okay, they have this helmet with electrodes, and they measured, and they said there that there was no temperature increase, and that the temperature increase that was because actually they reported some temperature increase was because of the fact that you were covering. Okay, so they insist a lot on the fact that there is no temperature increase. But if you talk with clinicians that are using this technique, they say, no, no, there is something. There is some heating there, OK? So there is some heating, OK? But it's very mild. I mean, we, we, that, that's also true. It's very mild, OK? That is not going to do anything normally to tissues, that, that heating, OK? It's not going. You're not going barely to feel it, OK? But yeah, they and they did that. And they do that. And actually, in, the, in, the, in, the, in some of the prototypes, I think they have temperature measurement systems there to be sure that they are not increasing the temperature too much and then to switch off the, the electronics. So yes, there is an increase in temperature. There is an increase in temperature. Yeah? Do you want to use your last system to treat paralysis? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Uh, the yeah, the command thing it's it's, a com it's it's what we are proposing basically it's an actuation system, of course, but you need to be able to send the comments. Okay, one idea would be to get the signals from the brain. Okay, but another idea which I find it's more interesting is to use our devices to measure signals. What I mean, in in a lot of patients, what happens or in amputees, what happens is that uh, you have some nerves that go through some muscles that are barely used, okay? Those muscles are barely used. And those are sending signals to those muscles, and the, to pick up the, the signals from the nerves directly is very challenging, okay? Because the voltages there are very, very tiny, okay? The voltages to, to record signals from, from a nerve, it's something that can be done, but in clinical applications, it's barely seen, because it's, the signals are so small, and you have so many noise around the body, that it's very difficult to distinguish those signals. So there is an interesting concept which was introduced a few years ago, which is called targeted re-innervation. And this, this concept is basically the following. So you have some nerves that go through some muscles that you barely use, or for example, are the nerves that went through a member that was amputated, okay? But it's not ever there. So basically what they do is to take those nerves, surgery, we're talking about surgery, and then to deploy them into the posterior muscles, which you don't use. And then the nerves are going to innervate those muscles, okay? So what that does is to, so the muscle then, it's going to contract when you think about moving your arm or whatever you think. And what is happening here is that what before it was very tricky to measure, what before it was very tricky to detect from the nerves, now it's very easy. And now it's very easy because the, the, the signals from the muscles are very powerful. Okay, the electrical signals from the nerves are very are tiny, are polluted with noise, but the signals from the muscles are very, very strong. So here the idea, one of the ideas we have is to use our systems to detect those signals from the muscles and then to relay those signals to another implant. That would be one of the approaches we would have for that. And this is something that our technology allows to do. And one of the benefits of our technology is that it's minimally invasive. We already have the two electrodes, so we can pick up the, the signals. And we already have uh, tried 
uh, not only downlink communications, but also uplink communications. We are still have not recorded EMG, of the, mass, the signals from the masses. This is something we will work for. That's, that's an interesting question. Well, that's basically the reason why we want to do something very thin. I mean, what's why we were interested in something that is very small and it's really easy to implant. Because there are systems, I mean, that are able to control a few number of muscles, okay? But the problem, I said, is it's difficult to implant them. It's larger. So we have the number of channels we have, let's say, it's, it's very limited. So the idea of the technology we are proposing is that we are going to be able to massively implant them. So we are going to have hundreds of channels. Hundreds, maybe it's an exaggeration, but tens or 100 channels. So now we are going to have not only one implant, one channel per muscle, even for the hand, but maybe two or three implants per muscle. And this is important because one of the problems with, with muscle stimulation by electrical means is that you don't have good control, okay? You basically stimulate or not stimulate. So by having three or four, let's say, implants per muscle, we are going to be able to stimulate different portions of the muscle. So we are going to be able to create the force that we apply in a better way. Okay? We are going to have more controllability. That's the reason why, that's basically the reason why we're interested in something very thin, okay? very, very easy to implant. So the, the, the answer is very relevant. So uh, I know you notice we, we probe the muscle to locate the point where we want to perform the stimulation and then we implant them. The, if we implant them properly, which means that the implant, it's all the length of the implant is within the muscle, they don't move. I mean, that's the result of the experimental study we performed a few, uh, one year ago, in which we basically had an implant that was properly implanted and through the whole study for a month, didn't move at all, okay? That's one thing. So, but you're right, I mean, even if we have this probing method, it's going to be very tricky to really put the implant wherever we want it specifically. So the idea is that one of the reasons we are also interested in, in planting a large number of them, it's to not taking care of that. I mean, just to implant them and then try them to see experiments. So to try number one, number two, and then to see the result in terms of movement, and from that, design the control algorithms. So one of the ideas why we are interested in implanting them in a large number is not to be, I mean, not to be careful with where we implant them, but to test them, and from that knowledge, then to decide afterwards which is the protocol we are going to use in order to create a specific movement or another movement. That's one of the reasons why. So. To allow them to move, that's not a good, uh, good idea because if they move out of the muscle, okay, basically we implant them inside the muscle. Okay? We implant them inside the muscle close to a nerve, okay, with the nerve that basically acts on that muscle. So if we implant them out of the muscle, they, they will bend, they, they will break after a while. Okay? So we don't want them to move. Okay? That's, that's for sure. In the case of the brain, that would be different. Of course, that's a technology that could also be applied. For applied for the brain, but we are still not considering it. Final question. So, I mean, from, from the outside, not mm -hmm. related to the bio stuff. So, your own view or how your research relates to other groups in the department doing biomedical uh, mm -hmm. research? Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well. Definitely, it, it links to research in other groups. It's when I was talking about electroporation. Uh, I was saying we are interested in treatment planning tools. This, for sure, it's, it's an area in which there is a lot of uh, 
overlap with other people in, in the department, and this is something that we tried, okay, in the past. It didn't, uh, didn't happen because of a number of reasons, but this is something that we are, we are still interested in these, uh, these things. And in terms of these implants, now we are proposing for, for paralysis, of course. This is all the field of biomechanics and rehabilitation that there is people working here, so that's something that is also of interest for us. And in general, whatever, whoever is interested in cancer. Yeah, yeah, well, we are, we are basically engineers, electrical engineers, delivering currents. We are not experts on uh, treatment planning. We are not experts on numerical tools. We use them. We do things with them. But we are, it's not our main focus. It's not, yeah, that's very right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's basically the case of what's called neuropathic pain. Okay, so it's pain that is related, in a lot of cases, is related with, actually with cancer treatments when chemotherapy is performed. This happens a lot because basically you damage the nerve and the nerve starts to do strange things. And one of the things that it's going to do is to send wrong signals, like pain signals. So in that case, it has been observed that applying stimulation, which in principle is not completely understood why, but applying stimulation helps. Okay, helps in terms of, of pain. Okay, it's applied at peripheral nerves, particularly in, in, in the head, in nerves on the occipital nerve, but it's also applied at the level of the spinal cord. Okay, epidural electrodes are placed there for, for pain. There is a huge controversy about that, about that, because when you are dealing with pain, the, the placebo effect is always very important. Okay, and here we are talking about patients uh, in which you are implanting a device with a a highly invasive surgery, device that sometimes is super expensive. So the placebo effect is, is very powerful. So there is still the debate of whether it's real or it's not real. What we know that it helps. How it helps, there is, there is debate about that. But yes, we are talking about neuropathic pain or uh, phantom limb pain in some cases. The basic neuropathic pain because of damage to the nerves. That, that's very Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.